What's up, girls? It's time for our Wednesday Live at 5. Um, I'm two minutes late, but I made it. Hey, girl. Hey, guys. I'm just going to wait for everyone to join that's going to join, at least for a couple minutes, and you guys can start asking your questions whenever. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'll continue to answer questions. Um, the questions that I put in my stories on Monday are going to continue to be answered over the course of, like, the next couple days just because there's so many questions that were asked. I want to say, like... 400 or so so I'm just gonna work on them slowly and chip away at them um, but yeah today this live is just about us chatting about wellness <clears throat> um, okay hi boo hi Amber <laughs> I have uh, some of my fully nourished students are very active and so I am well aware <laughs> of you guys and what you're what's going on with you hey is it true that women are more hungry during the second part of your cycle absolutely you guys keep in mind I think women need to really understand that when we drop that egg at ovulation our body is now completely and utterly consumed with the fact that that egg could have been fertilized and that's why we start creating progesterone right once that egg sac gets emptied it becomes that corpus luteum and we now are making progesterone progesterone is progestation hormone right but it also does so much more for us it speeds up our metabolism it helps with sleep it lowers our anxiety it's anti-stress why because there's a potential fertilization that could have taken place so treat that luteal phase as if it's the pre-pregnancy phase your body is preparing for a potential pregnancy um, and that egg would potentially implant around that two-week mark like right where your your normal period would start so even if you're not consumed with getting pregnant keeping that in mind is really important regardless of you if you're trying to get pregnant or not you need to understand what your body's all about and so that second phase of the cycle you're gonna absolutely be hungrier and need more calories and nutrients because you are preparing for a potential pregnancy Hi, Kirsten. Happy hump day. Hi, Katya. I have high DHEAS and normal testosterone. Is there a way to lower them? I do not ovulate, but I'm using progesterone. Hopefully that, hopefully that fixes that part. Keep in mind that DHEA will sulfate, which is what DHEAS is. It's sulfated DHEA. And sulfated DHEA, you can think of it as DHEA that's kind of being put on the back burner as storage to pull from whenever is necessary. A lot of times sulfation happens in the gut and so it's usually driven by inflammation. So whether there's low DHEAS or high DHEAS, a lot of times I'm looking towards inflammation and gut health and stress and just general like why is the body feeling so imbalanced? A lot of times over time just getting the body balanced, getting blood sugar balanced, getting the gut working better, you'll see your DHEAS levels uh, improve over time. Um, and then if you have normal testosterone levels, you don't wanna lower your testosterone. Also, what's the best type of juice to sip on throughout the day and why is it good to do so? Also, thank you so much for all your info. Yeah, so any type of juice you want, you want to stick to organic as much as possible, especially for those heavily, uh, those fruits that are going to be heavily sprayed. You want it to be 100% juice. Um, I usually just go to the glass bottle juice section at the store and we'll grab like grape and apple, um, whatever I prefer, and then orange juice from the refrigerated section. Um, it, the, the reason why I recommend sipping on juice throughout the day for some women, not everyone, is women that have had a past of yo-yo dieting, restriction, low carb eating, they're in a state of adrenal fatigue, just meaning their body is so stressed out. Their liver is really, really unhealthy, meaning that their liver can't store glycogen. Keep in mind, your liver is kind of like the battery pack of the body, and so your liver is meant to keep your blood sugar stable. If blood sugar levels are going up and down, which they are when we're eating or we're going long periods without eating, our liver kind of steps up to the plate to keep blood sugar balanced for us when we're not getting a meal but when we're depleted in nutrients we're not eating properly we keep telling our body it's going to go through a famine at any possible time we go on low carb diets that kind of thing we actually our liver becomes unable to store 
as much sugar. And so it's very hard for our body to keep blood sugar levels stable, also called hypoglycemia. And so a lot of times to get stress levels down so the body feels safe enough again, I'll have clients sip on juice throughout the day to just kind of keep blood sugar stable in addition to their regular meals and snack. I'm not talking about chugging juice throughout the day, talking about small sips in between meals and snacks to really keep things stable. But it's not necessary for everyone. Some people have okay blood sugar balance, but I find that some women are really, really shaky. We can't shake their insomnia. Um, they're feeling anxious all day long. They are feeling kind of not grounded. They're not recovering well after workouts, that kind of thing. We've really got to focus on getting blood sugar stable so juice can come in handy. And this is for people that are in a, in a pretty severe state. Is chicken liver beneficial like beef liver. They have different uh, qualities to them, so they are both beneficial. Lamb liver, chicken liver, and beef liver are all really beneficial, just in different ways. So chicken liver, I believe, is higher in vitamin K2, and beef liver is gonna be higher in the B vitamins, but they all are really nutrient dense. And I know chicken liver can sometimes taste a little better than beef liver, so if you can't do beef liver, kind of work up to it, um, and you can throw chicken liver in there uh, intermittently. Hi Jessica, any insight on a low iron panel for a 14 year old causes what can help? You should really listen to the podcast uh, Mito Life Radio with Morley Robbins. Um, it's really interesting to learn about iron. I mean, I've talked about be here before that just iron in general, the way that they test iron is really poor. They use ferritin to test iron and it should always be hemoglobin. Um, uh, having a low iron panel, you're very rarely actually anemic and women that take iron usually cause way more problems than, than not. Um, and it has a lot to do with the cofactors to iron, copper, zinc, those are all going to affect how our body is absorbing iron. In addition, keep in mind that the body can sometimes lower iron on purpose. Why would it do so? Well, iron feeds viruses, iron feeds bacteria, iron feeds pathogens. And so when you have an active infection, a lot of times you'll see iron uh, go low because the body's trying to hide that iron and store that high iron away from pathogens that would use it as fuel to continue to grow and proliferate. So those are a few things um, I would throw out. Um, still experiencing chronic pelvic pain when bending over forward, no period since July, uterine polyps, thick lining, causing pain, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, if you know you have uterine polyps and you know you have thick lining, then there you go, there's your answer. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what would be causing pelvic pain other than if you know, like you have thick uterine lining and, uh, polyps. Um, that can, uh, polyps can be helped. I'm not going to say cured or, um, you know, I, I don't know how, how your body would react to it, but it's really good idea to look into proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic, en proteolytic enzymes or systemic enzymes can break down a lot of scar tissue and usually have a pretty good effect on polyps. I'm not going to say they dissolve them completely because everyone's super different, but they can have a really good effect on reducing inflammation. And then, um, talking to the doctor, if, if your uterine lining is really that thick that you can feel it. Um, talking to the doctor about using bioidentical progesterone to induce the period can be helpful. Um, it doesn't fix the issue, but it does kind of sometimes help if you're feeling that uterine lining be very, very, very thick. How can I lower my cortisol levels nutritionally? I'm eating every three to four hours, protein, carb, and fat, making sure you're getting to bed by 10 p.m., and then lowering stress in your life. So what, you know, evaluating your job, evaluating your, um, your relationships, evaluating if you're taking time to do things that you enjoy, evaluating your schedule, the stressors that are placed upon your back. But internally, that's going to mostly be eating every three to four hours, maybe even every two to three hours. And then if you have imbalanced minerals, you can't get it in check with just food and sleep and sunshine, then I would look deeper into things like magnesium and potassium and, and actual mineral balance um, because those things will drive cortisol high. Hey Jess, do you have any opinions about antidepressants that aren't SSRIs? I've been coming off my SSRI this last year and I'm at the end of it, last five milligrams now. Unfortunately, I'm having unbearable 
uh, symptoms. Not doing well at all, especially the last two weeks. Never have been on it for depression. Bad OCD since 16. I'm looking into something else that isn't an SSRI. Um, I know that symptoms can be really bad post SSRI because SSRIs can like suppress uh, thyroid function. They can mess with cortisol levels. And so coming off of them is just as bad. Um, if you've had bad OCD, have you ever checked for copper toxicity and gotten your minerals tested and balanced because a lot of people that struggle with like OCD, um, anxiety, depression, um, manic depressive disorder or manic disorder, um, or psycho like psychosis, um, uh, or even so far as like sociopaths have been tested. A lot of mental disorders are driven by copper toxicity. Not to say that all should be thrown in the same bucket, but um, they did this one study amongst like serial killers and sociopaths, and they found that most of them had high copper in the brain, um, and that's like you know far to one spectrum, right? Like copper, uh, copper can cause severe brain symptoms and mental symptoms and nervous system symptoms. So I think it's very important to check that out. A lot of times, heavy metal toxicity can cause things like OCD. CD. And of course, I'm not saying that it is the cause, but those are things that should be looked at. And of course, medication in the short run can be very helpful to limit symptoms. However, it's important to understand that, you know, it's not a medication deficiency that's causing that. It's It could be something else. Now, of course, it could be something in your past, you know, things like this can be driven by trauma. Um, and and uh, if if that's the case, EMDR therapy is very, very helpful as well. So I usually take a holistic approach. If a client, you know, is looking for medication, I'll help them try to find a doctor that's going to help them work with them. But then in the meantime, I'm also looking at minerals. I'm also sending them to counseling with EMDR um, and uh, any kind of neurofeedback because it is usually a holistic issue. Um, but yeah, I, have, I, I haven't found clients that um, have found full help with medications like they need a, a, a more holistic approach just because medications are not fixing the issue um, is there a reason why certain B vitamins are recommended separately in FN, specifically interested in B2 effect on estrogen and thyroid? Yeah, I mean, riboflavin is very helpful for gut issues. A lot of people who have digestive disorders are depleted in vitamin B2. And then vitamin B2 is needed to make vitamin B3. It's a precursor to vitamin B3. So a lot of people um, who are deficient in B2 are going to be deficient in B3. So I like B B2, um, I, but... Uh, B vitamins that speed up the metabolic rate are going to be vitamin B1 and B3. So vitamin B2 have, can have a slight lowering effect on the metabolic rate, but B2 makes B3, which is going to speed up the metabolic rate. So it's kind of, they all work together in weird ways. But B vitamins in, a lot of people are depleted in B vitamins, which is why I talked about them specifically. A lot of times practitioners will just kind of brush over and say, oh, you need B vitamins, right? And they just kind of like group them all together. And I'm like, well, there are very specific B vitamins that are actually very, very therapeutic um, when used uh, like in single amounts. Now, of course, they can kind of imbalance each other and it's good to take a B complex for the most part. However, some people find help with specific nutrients. Riboflavin, um, if you look at some of the studies, they're thinking that it might actually have a positive effect on the gut bacteria and gut inflammation because it might even act like a prebiotic and feed certain bacteria that you want to be fed in your digestive tract that actually create a better um, metabolic environment, if that makes sense. So B vitamins are very powerful. I would say typically the two things that people are the most deficient in and that are messing with their health the most are going to be magnesium deficiency and B vitamin deficiency. Um, and, and those are going to be the two things that wreck your metabolism the most. So that's why I, I do kind of focus in on B vitamins. And there is the brewer's yeast slash nutritional yeast recipe for B vitamin cookies because I, I need you guys making sure you're getting B vitamins in regularly. I keep hearing chia seeds or xenoestrogens. Is this true? Yeah. Yeah. That's why like in seed cycling, people will do like the whole like flax chia or pumpkins or it's it's flax and chia 
for um, the, the xenoestrogen. It's not xenoestrogens, it's phytoestrogens. So xenoestrogens are foreign estrogens. Xeno means foreign in Latin, and estrogen obviously means estrogen. So xenoestrogens are chemical estrogens, whereas phytoestrogens are plant estrogens. So I would say chia seeds and flax seeds are phytoestrogens, but not xenoestrogens. And then um, so are all seeds. Really all seeds are have plant estrogens in them. Um, I can't think of one seed that doesn't have plant estrogens, but chia and flax tend to be the highest. Is a baked apple different than a normal apple, like the nutrients you get from it? Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. Um, I wouldn't say they're like different, but the baked apple is going to be a lot easier to digest because the pectin is broken down and not raw. So there, I wouldn't say like nutrient wise, they're any different, but your body might have an easier time absorbing the nutrients from the cooked apple. Um, but I wouldn't say nutrient wise, they're, they're different. They, they might just digest differently. Having some seriously itchy scalp and dandruff, could it be gut related? Coming off antibiotics, any treatment suggestions? Um, uh, that is probably a bigger issue than you actually think it is because if you're getting itchy scalp and dandruff, a lot of times things having to do with the scalp is either bacterial or fungal in nature. And if you're coming off antibiotics, that shows it probably messed with microbial balance quite a bit. Um, I would always wait until after antibiotics a couple weeks before you mess with the gut at all. You don't want to take probiotics coming off antibiotics because the gut's already kind of messed up. You don't want to cause further imbalance. You kind of want to just let things even out. Um, I guess topically for itchy scalp and dandruff, things that um, contain sulfur can sometimes help or borax rinses can help. Um, just things that are going to kill fungus, but you kind of have to pinpoint is it fungus or is it bacterial related. Um, but like apple cider vinegar is antifungal, um, MSM is antifungal, borax is antifungal, and you can always make like a, a watered down rinse to put on the scalp. But I would, if, if it gets bad, I would check that out with your doctor and maybe even get a dermatologist to check it out for you. I know you've heard this on FN page, but headaches are getting worse week six or seven now every day. I'm almost not able to do anything now. Could this maybe be a withdrawal effect? A withdrawal from what? Just like SSRIs or a withdrawal from what? Um, I'm wondering... Oh, I, you know, a few of you guys are struggling with headaches. So I'm like, okay, what's going on? I've seen headaches, headaches before. I've seen like migraines before, but that's like pretty bad. So, um, I would maybe stop if you're taking any supplements, I would stop all supplements, stop them. Um, and then I would see after like two or three days, okay, it has that pause things because if it's happening every single day and there's no change via the cycle there could be a lot of estrogen coming out of the body but it can be other things it can be supplements it can be detox um it can be um it can be blood sugar issues you're seeing blood sugar dysregulation or what's happening is your body's tapping into a lot of free fatty acids but the first thing i would do is just stop everything. Stop supplements, stop detox, stop anything that you're doing that's extra besides eating, sleeping, exercising, and pooping. Make sure you are not constipated when you are struggling with a headache or that's what's causing the headache. Um, so usually I look to blood sugar, I look to estrogen, and I look to constipation. If somebody is constipated, whether they are still pooping regularly but it's not a full bowel movement or they're just not pooping at all, that's driving the headache 100% because there's just toxic crap recirculating. So that would be the thing. And the second thing, like, you know, digestion wise, how's digestion? Are you, uh, you know, breaking down your foods okay? Um, are you seeing things move through your digestive tract pretty quickly? So yeah, I would look to digestion slash constipation, blood sugar issues, and estrogen. I know this is asked often, but it is, is it possible for bioprogesterone to help grow the egg and actually ovulate? I love how I had two semi-regular periods on it. Absolutely. So keep in mind, partially what's usually keeping us from ovulating is stress. We're either our body has high cortisol, we're inflamed, our thyroid's not functioning properly, and progesterone, low progesterone is going to drive this issue further. And so getting your progesterone levels up, um, whether you know, you're know you doing that naturally or you're using bioidentical progesterone can a lot of times help you actually ovulate on your own because 
progesterone is going to lower stress. It's going to help you sleep. It's going to lower inflammation. It's going to support your thyroid, all things that help you ovulate. So yes, a lot of women don't need to be on bioidentical progesterone long-term. They sometimes can use it for like three to six months and they're good. But yeah, if it, also Amber, if you're taking progesterone and you're getting headaches, that could be a sign that maybe things are just moving too fast and you can't handle it. How do you think we support our vitality as women? Um, uh, that's like a very large overarching question. Um, vitality is really like, I would say for most women, it's keeping stress to a minimum. We live in a modern world where we are bombarded with stress. And of course it depends on our lifestyle. If we have a very slow lifestyle, we live in the middle of nowhere. We don't sit in traffic all the time. We, you know, don't work like a nine to five job that we have to commute to. Then we might be under less stress than the average woman, but most women are are um, working, they are mothers, or they're, you know, um, taking care of their home, they are doing it all. And as women, we need to learn to kind of protect ourselves um, from stressors. And so we need to be very, very well versed in evaluating our stressors. And the way that we do that is by learning and knowing our body. If our body is crying out for help, if our body is telling us things are wrong, a lot of times we try to fit our body into our narrative where we can't do that. We have to fit our routine and our lifestyle with our body. And a lot of people get really frustrated because they're trying to reach their health goals or they're trying to be vital as a woman. They're trying to have good hormones and, and optimal health. And they are also you know, um, working out for two hours a day and working a nine to five job and have three children and are cooking dinner and saying yes to everyone and everything and health and that is not going to be synonymous. So it's really protecting your time as if, you know, you are your your strongest most important advocate you have to protect your time you have to understand that you can't do it all and if you do do it all you're going your health's going to suffer period end of story um if you push your body too hard your body's not you're, you're not we're not small men unfortunately and so we do not uh work in the same way that a male body does we're not as resilient to stress and so we need to be aware of that and overall i think that what's happening right now in society unfortunately is women are trying to be small men and we aren't and so our bodies are completely and utterly rebelling and people are wondering why and it's like because our bodies are not as resilient to stress as a man's that that doesn't mean we're weaker it just means we're different and so i i think really uh supporting our vitality is really really choosing our battles, taking care of stress in our lives, and setting up our life in a way that allow us to manage our stress well. So many of us have set up boundaries that are way too far um, away from us, and they are really damaging us on a daily basis. So setting up boundaries, lowering stress, limiting stress, and creating routines and habits that are, are going to actually support our vitality which is, you know, basic nutrition, sleep, making sure we're getting our cycle, um, exercise that supports and honors our bodies, sunlight, um, getting out in nature, and uh, still putting in time to relax and do things that we enjoy doing just because we enjoy doing them, not because somebody else needs us to do it. Um, things that we should do for fun. But that would be the basics. And then the more in-depth things are making sure our nutrients are balanced, our minerals are balanced, making sure the fundamental things our cells need um, are given to our cells. And a lot of times hormones and vitality takes care of, will take care of themselves. Um, Amber, yes, that's me. Shaky, dizzy, insomnia the last month too. Yeah, make sure your blood sugar is balanced. Make sure you're not eating too many carbs uh, in relationship to protein. Um, can you take the aspirin and vitamin E at the same time? Um, that would be something that you need to research yourself. They are both blood thinners, so they can potentially thin the blood. So I would be careful taking them both at the same time. Does kombucha live up to its gut health hype? I love it, but just wondering if it really helps. Not really. Um, it has some, some weird strains. A lot of times when it's um, commercially produced, they use a lot of lactic acid producing bacteria, which can actually mess with gut it, in that, or gut balance. So I've actually seen people drink kombucha every day and destroy their guts and have to like heal from destroying their guts with kombucha. So um, I wouldn't, of course, it's not something to be afraid of. I just wouldn't like chug a whole bottle every day and think like, oh my gosh, I'm supporting my gut so much because when we introduce tons and tons of wild strains of bacteria, we don't know what's gonna happen. 
vegetables go straight through me is there a better way to consume vegetables and lettuce you guys know i don't like vegetables and lettuce so i would say don't do it your body's telling you obviously something's not uh being digested properly um raw greens you're not a cow so there you go um so i would cook my greens if i was going to eat greens i personally don't eat a lot of greens and when i do i just eat a broth um and then cruciferous vegetables you guys know i'm not a fan they're super anti-thyroid so um i give you full permission to not eat that many vegetables <laughs> how can you know if inflammation gut issues regular bowel movements bloating but nothing crazy wondering since higher dheas and always have wondered if i do have gut issues going on just because you have a regular bowel movement doesn't mean that you don't have gut issues if you're bloated or you have any type of indigestion if you have any type of hormonal symptoms those can always be dysbiosis but you really want to look at your history were you cesarean born or were you or were you vaginally born if you were cesarean born you most likely have gut issues if you were bottle fed you most likely have gut issues and if you um, had more than, I would say, three rounds of antibiotics before the age of three, probably have gut issues. So you, you kind of have to look at your history when it comes to gut issues and not just look at your symptoms as now. Look at your history as a child. What did you eat as a child? What were you exposed to as a child? And uh, that's going to translate to now and how we're set up in our adult life. Month three of no mid-cycle bleeding, so regardless, that is improving. Woohoo! Trying to stay positive. I know it can really, really suck. Um, if you feel like you're, if you truly feel like your symptoms are detox, activated charcoal in the evenings is very, very helpful. Um, but it sounds like you might have a, a blood sugar imbalances, and then coming off SSRIs doesn't help the, the issue. Keep in mind, SSRIs are very thyroid suppressive, and so once you go off, you really want to recheck your thyroid after uh, you've been off for about a month or so. Because because they can really mess with things. Also, just started reintroducing dairy after nursing a sensitive baby, still nursing, but he's outgrowing it. Woohoo! Should I still be supplementing calcium? That's a question for your doctor, um, especially if your doctor prescribed you calcium. Um, yeah, that's just kind of a question uh, that you need to ask him or her, just because I'm not really sure your situation. Um, but yeah, you do get a lot of calcium from dairy and I wouldn't overdo it on the calcium. That's for sure. Cause it starts to calcify everything. Like you might get tonsil stones, um, gallstones, kidney stones. Um, you might start to feel really tense and tight and like irritable, um, because it's a very calcifying mineral. So, um, you want to make sure that you're not getting too much calcium in relationship to magnesium. Just have my fasting insulin blood work. Any insights? Um, what are they? Um, you want to make sure that your insulin is lower. Um, your, like I would say below eight is probably a good idea. If it's above eight, you want to really work on that insulin sensitivity of the cells, lowering inflammation, getting the liver really healthy, that type of thing. But, um, yeah, what, what are they? That, that would be my insight. Want to make sure I'm getting enough, but hate taking pills unless I have to. Yeah, I don't blame you. Okay, is it normal to get freckles all over your body as you age? I'm very con conscientious about my sun exposure in a healthy way. My mom started getting them around my age, so I'm thinking is it, it isn't bad. If it's genetic, I mean, that's kind of something that you can't help. Like, my mom is pretty freckly as well, and so I'm starting to get freckles a little bit, um, like especially on my chest and shoulders where I get exposed to sunlight the most. And uh, I kind of, like, knew that that was just going to happen because it, it's, it's, like, my mom is pretty freckly. So... Um, but you also want to make sure like, what are you eating? Keep in mind the fats that we eat interact with the sun. If so, we're eating a lot of fats that oxidize when exposed to light and heat and oxygen, light and heat and oxygen. So if we're eating lots of polyunsaturated fats, canola oil, soybean oil, nut and seed oils, those types of things, that's going to oxidize with the sunlight. So there is a difference between like normal freckling and, you know, See, starting to see those sunspots and uh, and a lot of sun damage. I'm 51 and haven't had a period in 85 days. What's the best progesterone schedule for me? I'm currently doing 14 days off and 14 days on. I gain weight, PMS, and histamine intolerance while off progesterone. Yeah, I don't blame you because a lot of times that will happen. Um, I it really just depends. Some menopausal women like to still cycle it, but if you haven't had a period in a while, you want to make sure because it's only been 85 days. So during menopause, what happens is during perimenopause, your uh, before you go through menopause, your periods will become closer and closer and closer together, and then you will start to scatter farther and farther apart until they just completely stop. Um, so you want to make sure you completely stop before you go to a daily schedule of progesterone, and talk to your doctor who prescribed you the progesterone. Usually, menopausal women 
will go to a more daily schedule, um, but some women like to still stay on a cycle. So it just kind of depends. But either way is not wrong. It's more just what works for your body. Why is intermittent fasting bad for women? Because starving yourself tells your body you're in a famine, and then when you go to eat, you actually will store so much fat. And during the time that you're not eating, you're not running on thin air, and so what are you running on? Your muscle and your fat, the, your fat stores. Now, you might think that's a good thing, but if you're pulling from your fat stores under duress, free fatty acids are being released into the bloodstream very quickly, which causes insulin resistance and also can cause lots of inflammation, things like hair loss, skin issues, etc., etc. So a lot of women will find that the first two to six months of intermittent fasting go really, really well because they think that their fake energy is good when in reality it's stress hormones, things like cortisol and adrenaline, which give you this feeling of like, oh my gosh, I'm a go-getter, like everything's great, I feel amazing, I'm losing all this weight, amazing, you know, like this is awesome. And then like what starts to happen is like you start to see things really slow down. Like you might hit a weight loss plateau, you might start to like get hangry, you might start to get irritable and shaky and like ah, I want to like kill everybody and you really start to see yourself go downhill really fast and it's because your body can only run on stress for so long so intermittent fasting in my opinion almost always hurts women I've never seen a woman come to me and be like wow I intermittent fasted for a whole year and it worked really well for me they're like yeah I intermittent fast for like three months and then destroyed my freaking hormones so that's usually the result that we see unfortunately and I try to save women as much as possible as I can but some of them just have to learn for themselves also, what do you think about pregnenolone? Love pregnenolone, especially for menopausal women. You just have to be very careful that you're limiting stress while you take pregnenolone because it is a precursor to progesterone, which is awesome. A precursor to DHEA, which can turn into estrogen and testosterone, which is awesome. But it's also a precursor to cortisol, which is not so fun. And so to shunt pregnenolone from going into cortisol, you're just taking care of yourself. You're keeping your blood sugar balanced. You're getting enough sleep. You're exercising regularly. You're getting out into the sunlight, that kind of thing. You're just keeping stress low. And usually pregnenolone won't shunt into cortisol. So pregnenolone is awesome though. It's, it's incredibly anti-aging and, and really helps promote a lot of youth. How do you feel about high intensity intervals on the elliptical for fat loss? Trying to get my hit in a few times a week, but can't do many plyo high impact moves since baby. Yeah, I mean, that's totally fine. Um, and it doesn't, you know, like high intensity interval training is really relative to the person. Like some people, you know, need to do burpees for high intensity interval training, but some people just need to do really fast squats or really fast lunges. So um, an elliptical is fine, especially if it's just for like 10 minutes, like 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off kind of thing. But um, yeah, you throwing in hit a few times a week is not going to cause too much stress and you can do it however you want. It's just really about getting that heart rate up, pushing as hard as you can for like 30 to 40 seconds and then taking a break for like 30 seconds to a minute. Hi, will spironolactone affect my hormones? I'm taking for hair loss. What do you recommend? I'm 48. Um, spironolactone is a potassium sparing diuretic, so it lowers aldosterone levels. A lot of people who need spironolactone have way bigger issues, and spironolactone unfortunately doesn't fix those issues. It just helps you spare potassium, which lowers aldosterone. So I recommend that if you have hair loss, getting a hair tissue mineral analysis and figuring out where your minerals are at, figuring out why you need spironolactone. Usually women that do well on spironolactone have low potassium, and so they need a potassium sparing diuretic. So, um... Uh, but yeah, hair loss is not always driven by high testosterone. It can also be driven by inflammation, which is a lot of times the case. Thyroid is issues, hypothyroidism, um, and mineral uh, deficiencies or imbalances, heavy metals, things like that. So I'm always looking deeper. Um, but yeah, it could be a million different things. How do you remove heavy metals from your body? Um, you start to balance your minerals. So when you do a hair tissue mineral analysis, you collect um, a piece of your hair, a couple pieces of your hair really close to the scalp, which shows you about three to four months of what all the minerals in your body have been doing the past couple months. And a lot of people have imbalanced levels of calcium, magnesium, um, sodium, and potassium, which is going to affect your metabolic rate, how fast your cells are utilizing nutrients and fuel. And your metabolic rate is going to affect how your body detoxifies because a slow, slow, slow metabolism doesn't want to move anything out of the body. It's not strong enough to handle it. And so the goal with mineral balancing is to get your minerals to such a state and get your metabolism to such a balanced state 
that your body starts moving metals on its own. Once your body starts to move metals on your uh, on its own, which you'll see as you retest your hair tissue mineral analysis, usually at the three to six months month mark, you'll start to move metals out of your hair. Then you can start to add in extra heavy metal detox support once the body is ready. A lot of these systems like TRS and all these different systems that tell you you need to detox heavy metals, you absolutely do. That's that's 100% correct. However, you don't want to do it when the body's not ready because that's very dangerous and those metals will actually find themselves in places they don't belong. And so it's really about balancing your first level minerals like phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, getting those really balanced, then the body will start to do the rest and then you can add an extra support to bind to minerals or pull minerals, that type of thing. But yeah, it's definitely a process. Getting heavy metals out of the body safely takes takes time and it takes patience and you gotta let the body run the show. Favorite B2 brand, um, I use, I've been using bulk supplements brand, but B2 is so bitter, just FYI. I got the, the powder and it was a big mistake. I should have gotten the capsules. But keep in mind, B2 does slow the metabolism down, so just kind of pay attention to how you react. I have PCOS and I've noticed that when I get my B12 shot, it helps me get a period during the month from what I've seen. Is there any correlation? Absolutely. A lot of women with PCOS are uh, deficient in all B vitamins. So yes. Um, also, B12 helps us detoxify glyphosate, which is a pesticide. A lot of women with PCOS are being exposed to pesticides a lot, whether they're eating non-organic food, they're working in an environment where they're spraying pesticides a lot, they have past a lot of past pesticide exposure, that kind of thing. Um, B12 does help help uh, detoxify glyphosate from the body so that can also help reduce the toxin load but yeah b vitamins are in, uh, really essential for women with pcos how high can riboflavin be dosed separately um, I would go by the base dose. I hate giving out dosages because it's so unique to the person and it really just takes experimentation. And I think it's just important to really start as small as possible and just see how your body reacts. I took plan B three years ago and I'm losing my hair and my periods are a mess. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, Plan B is a really high dose of um, uh, Levin or Gestrel, I believe. So it's going to be like taking a huge handful of birth control pills at once. And so those are really high in xenoestrogens. And so a lot of times it will mess with your progesterone levels. It will deplete you of so many nutrients very quickly, like vitamin C, vitamin E, B vitamins, um, vitamin A even can be a, a problem. So a lot of times if there's a, a bad birth control experience, whether it's plan B or uh, something else, um, you want to really look to nutrients nutrients you want to look to the thyroid because sometimes it can mess with the thyroid and you want to look to estrogen and progesterone um, and possibly stress because that can all those nutrients being imbalanced for so long especially if it's been going on for years could possibly drive like metabolic imbalance like blood sugar imbalances and things like that <clears throat> P.S. Have your shepherd's pie recipe in the oven and made your peppers last night so good. I'm so glad. I just made the shepherd's pie like two days ago and I already like ate the whole thing. I ate it for like dinner, lunch, dinner, lunch today, and now it's gone for dinner. Can magnesium glycinate capsules be opened and taken in liquid to better absorb? Um, you can. Yeah, I mean, I don't see a problem with it. It's probably going to taste, oof, but you can absolutely do that. Um... Capsules are absorbed pretty well because the capsules dissolve right when they get into your stomach. Uh, but if you want to, to drink it, the powder, you absolutely can. What's your favorite B Complex brand? I usually like Thorne's Stress B Complex. That's a pretty good B Complex. Um, I a lot of times will blend my own B vitamins based on what my client's needs are and also like what my personal needs are. But if you're looking for just a basic complex, uh, just a Thorns Stress B Complex is pretty good. What is uric acid? What does high uric acid mean? Um, I believe that has to do with the kidneys, and a lot of times if it's high, that's gonna be that's gonna point to kidney stress or maybe improper protein digestion. But you of course want to ask your doctor uh, to make sure that everything's okay. Bell's palsy twice, and I'm only 24. Three doctors say it's due to my PCOS. Do you think this could be true? Um, uh, it could be. There's there could be other issues at play. A lot of times, uh, I, I find that a lot of times doctors, if you've been diagnosed with something like, for example, PCOS, they love to just say like, oh, you have PCOS, it's just that. And I'm like, mm, not good enough for me. Um, but it just kind of is is relying upon how much you want to dig. Do you want to dig into uh, 
what issues are driving those factors. Um, there could be a further imbalances driving it. I, I think that saying like, oh, it's because you have PCOS is kind of a cop out, but that's just me. I find with my gut issues that if I don't have, eat every three hours or so, I get nausea. Is this common with gut issues? The nausea comes from the left side at the waist. Thanks. I know I asked many questions. You can ask as many questions as you want, Gina. Um, so left side at the waist is pancreas. So, um, I mean, yeah, it could just be that your body is needing the sugar. Um, a lot of people have done a lot of damage to their pancreases um, just because they've eaten a lot of polyunsaturated fats. And unfortunately, polyunsaturated fats really damage those beta cells. And, uh, you know, we know that beta cells can get to a point where they just die because they are so damaged. But progesterone and pregnenolone actually help regenerate those beta cells. In addition, a lot of times if you're starting to get your gut issues figured out, you'll find that you do need uh, to eat to produce pancreas enzymes so uh, I would say just listen to your body if you're getting nauseous at the three-hour mark I can't I, I could only speculate as to why I'm really not sure um, but I do know that left side at the waist would most likely be the pancreas I'm 33 and I randomly experienced several days of hot flashes. I had my hormones and thyroid checked and everything was normal. Any thought? It was hot flashes about 20 or 30 minutes apart. Well, I see that you you call yourself low carby Barbie. How long have you been low carb? Uh, I would look to cortisol, adrenaline. I would see how you're breaking down your estrogens. Uh, I usually, in that case, especially if it's... Ugh, uh, menopausal type symptoms. You want to get on that very quickly, especially if my client's been on a low carb diet. I do not want my client going through early menopause due to metabolic stress. So I highly recommend a Dutch test to make sure everything's good. Um, where your stress levels are at, where your adrenaline's at, how your estrogen is being detoxified. A lot of times, uh, if you're on a low carb diet, you're going to find yourself, uh, kind of not making enough progesterone and going towards estrogen, poor detoxification since the liver needs sugar to detoxify estrogen. So, um, I mean, it could be a million things, but my biggest thing is I would look to cortisol levels. And then did your doctor test LH to FSH ratio? When did you get your hormones tested? They should always be tested around day 19 to 21 of the cycle post ovulation. So there's a lot of factors, right? Like I'm, I'm throwing a lot at you, but, uh, when I hear like a little tidbit of someone's story, I always want to know more because uh, there could be a million things going on. And uh, I always need to know someone's history as well as uh, what I would want to see the the proper lab test. Because I see a lot of people getting lab tests done and their doctor's doing like, whatever day you want, whatever day of your cycle you want. And I'm like, that is worthless. Worthless piece of paper. Crumple that up and throw it in the trash can because it's worthless. You need to get your, women need to get their hormones tested between 19 to 20, or day 19 to 21 of the cycle or five to seven days post ovulation. Um, I always want to know like, does someone have a period? Do you have a regular period? Do you know if you're ovulating? Are you sleeping well? Um, like I need to know so much, but I would look to stress hormones and I would make sure you got your hormones tested at the right time and I would consider a Dutch test. How could I tell if I have extra weight to lose or if this weight is healthy and protective? Um, I think it's just like you kind of know what a healthy weight is. How do you feel in your skin? Like, do you feel um, bigger than you should be? Do you feel kind of like ick, icky about um, where you're at? And not compared to like what society says is healthy, but actually what you feel. Like, do you feel comfortable in your own skin and sexy? Do you look at your fat distribution and see that you look pretty shapely, but not um, I would say bumpy would be the word. Like if you see that fat distribution is weird and you have fat deposits at weird as at weird places in your body, that's usually a sign that you're storing more fat than you should be comfortable with. However, when you're trying to heal your metabolism and you're storing yourself after a low carb diet and lots of stuff, that's going to change. You're, you're just going to have to let your body do its thing. I, I think a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, am I at a healthy weight? And then they're like, oh no, I'm not at a healthy weight. Like what should I do? And I'm just like, if you're doing all the right things, you're balancing your blood sugar, you're eating enough, you're exercising, you're sleeping, give your body some time, especially like look at your past year and a half. What kind of stressors has your body been under? Um, you know, what, what have you been going through? If, if you think that your body's reaction aesthetically is pretty appropriate for the stressors that's been under, then just leave it alone. It's probably your healthy weight as of now. The, the, the biggest issue is you never want to see yourself steadily gaining, 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 gaining and just continue to gain like usually if you gain a little weight after a low carb diet out of necessity to heal your metabolism usually it's around 10 to 20 pounds and then it 
stops, right? It's not like, okay, I'm continuing to gain and gain and gain and gain and continue to trend upward. You don't want that to happen. But yeah, I mean, it's really about how you feel in your own skin. There are times when I know I've been under so much stress and I sit more, I, my body sits more comfortably at 150. That's just how it is. And then there are times when I'm sleeping really well, I'm on it with nutrition, I'm, you know, lowering my stress a lot, I'm really taking care of myself, doing things I enjoy, and I'm sitting more at 130. It just kind of is more dependent upon what's going on in my life at that moment, what stress I've been under the past 6 to 12 months, and I let my body kind of do its thing. I'm not going to try to like manipulate it and be like, you need to fit into the, my skinny jeans, you know, like it's just, it's going to react to its environment. That's what bodies do. Is it okay to take 300 milligrams of magnesium every night? I have PCOS and I'm insulin resistant. Um, that's a question for your doctor, but I usually recommend five times your body weight in milligrams. So that's fairly low. I had the corpus luteum cyst on US on US the day before I miscarried at eight weeks. Could it be a progesterone issue or chromosomal like they're saying? could be either um had the corpus luteum cyst i'm not sure what you mean by the, the corpus luteum cyst like maybe you got like a, a cyst growth um but yeah i mean it could be a lot of things a lot of times i find that they're just saying like oh it's this or they like throw all these like weird fancy terms and i'm i find much more realistic issues going on i'm always looking at mineral balance gut issues inflammation levels progesterone full thyroid panel like i want to see i want to make sure that what they're saying is true that's fine i'll take what they say right chromosomal issue awesome okay great I'm going to make sure it's nothing else and I'm going to test all the things. And then if I don't find anything, then okay, it's a chromosomal issue. Does that make sense? It's kind of one of those things where it could totally be that. But if your gut tells you, if you, you feel it in your heart that it could be more, it could be something else, I highly recommend pursuing that. Have you read anything about glutathione and bile production? I have super low GSH level and also symptoms of low bile production related. It could be. Um, low glutathione can be due to like low selenium levels. It could be lo that the, the liver is just burdened and the body is, you know, you're moving through glutathione very quickly. But yeah, bile is absolutely needed to move junk out of the liver or glutathione production will be low. And so if low bile production is something that you suspect, you definitely want to work on bile flow, whether that's bitter things like bitter herbs or beets, beet juice. Those are really rich in um, potassium, but also are going to help with bile flow. Or have you looked into like castor oil packs or coffee enemas or even supplementing ox bile? There is a supplement called uh, Bile Builder. Uh, I'm spacing on the brand, but it's called Bile Builder and it has ox bile, taurine in it. It has a few little bitters in it. It's very, very effective for helping with, with bile flow. Can you review which nutrients are in need for both phase one and phase two of estrogen liver detox? I'm going to be honest with you. There's about 12 of each and I'm sp I'm not sure of all of them. Um, I like don't have them memorized, but um, you can Google phase one and phase two of liver detox and there's like handy little pictures. But phase one has, uh, has B vitamins, I believe, um, has vitamin C, I believe vitamin E, and then of course like DIM, uh, that kind of thing. And then phase, I can't remember if it's phase one or phase two that's B vitamins. Don't quote me on this, I'll review. But yeah, you can uh, Google that for sure. <laughs> what do you think of cultured coconut for gut health? It really depends. Like I, I'm, I'm thinking about it because it really depends on what they're using to culture the the coconut, um, and what ingredients are in there. A lot of times, like cultured coconut, or if you're talking about like the koyo, um, just make sure it doesn't have any other added ingredients except for like coconut meat and the actual bacteria. But usually, when I'm trying to heal my gut, I'm not trying to like re put bacteria back into my digestive tract unless I know it's properly put into a capsule and it's going to get where it needs to go. Because if you're working on getting transit time quick and you're trying to get bacteria out of the small intestine, when you're eating a bunch of probiotic rich foods, bacteria is just starting to get into the digestive tract again and you've worked really hard to clear it out so i'm really careful with probiotic rich foods and ferments when somebody's trying to get their gut health better because nine times out of ten it just increases lactic acid production which is going to increase histamine production and it puts them in the wrong direction 
I've not eaten an avocado in two months. I used to eat half a day and now I want to vom when I see one. <laughs> no idea why I never crave it anymore, right? Because you're super satisfied with your saturated fats. Same thing, literally same thing happened to me. I used to eat so many avocados all of the time and now when I look at one, I literally get nauseous, like they gross me out. Frequent urination at nighttime and bloating even when not eating before bed. Also cold hands and cold feet, thyroid related. Yeah, thyroid related and stress related. If you're urinating more than five times a day, there's most likely some type of stress. So I would make sure I'm hydrating with bone, uh, like bone broth and uh, mineral rich foods like juices and coconut water and not try to over consume water. Make sure you're getting lots of minerals in, specifically sodium and potassium, and then balancing your blood sugar is gonna be really important. You should see that improve over time. Um, if you're bloated when you're not eating, um, make sure you're chewing your food really well and you're eating frequently to keep digestion moving. Are you constipated? Because that's going to be a huge thing that will drive bloating. Could you share, share some more protein suggestions? I've been tracking and I'm having a hard time getting my percentage higher. Um, all types of meats, collagen and gelatin are what I use the most to add protein to meals. Um, bone broth, uh, any type of shellfish, um, eggs, dairy, so uh, like lower fat milk, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, um, low fat cheeses, things like skim mozzarella, um, all types of cheeses. Uh, what else did I miss? Fish. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, if you need, like sometimes a casein protein powder can be helpful. I just try to um, focus on uh, whole food protein sources if possible. Ivy says, yes, so many antibiotics as a child, so what now? Um, have you gotten a gut test? Have you, do you see, do you know your bacterial balance? I highly recommend the GI map. I've seen every type of gut test. I've seen like the doctor's data one, the Genova one. I prefer the GI map by a land, by, by a mile because uh, the other ones don't tell you like what specific strains you have. And I just really like the GI map because you can actually start to target uh, your, your gut bacteria specifically with what's going on in there. How do I H pylori? I've taken antibiotics twice and still positive. Uh, you got to look at the big picture. What's going on? What is your body stressed out? Where are your stomach acid levels at? Um, do you like, what is your diet? Like, I mean, so many questions. Um, but I would say nine times out of 10, if antibiotics are not wiping it out, your stomach acid is low. And so what's happening is you're killing the H. pylori, your stomach acid is low. And so it's just coming right back. And so usually after an antibiotic round, you've got to build up your stomach acid with hydrochloric acid. But a lot of times antibiotics are pretty ineffective with H. pylori because it's kind of like will corkscrew its way into the stomach lining. So H. pylori is better killed with things like mastic gum, Nuka honey um, and other antibacterials like oregano and grapefruit seed extract and things like that. But killing H. pylori is a process. It's not like one of those things where it's like one and done. You know, it got there for a reason. Your a healthy body wouldn't allow H. pylori to take up residence in the digestive tract. And I'd say nine times out of ten, there's other uh, bacterial imbalances going on in the digestive tract, not just H. pylori. Any treatment suggestions for tonsil stones? Magnesium, yeah, high, high doses of magnesium. If your tissues are calcifying, there's an issue. Also, think about taking vitamin K2 because if your calcium can't get into the bones and the teeth, which it needs vitamin K4, then it's gonna get into the soft tissues, which is not where it belongs. Just to attest to not eating a ton of veggies, I had a plant-based meal the other day at a health food cafe and felt so bloated and cold afterwards. So crazy how it's considered health food. I know, like I am like so anti-salad. I wanna make a shirt that just says like, shove your salad in your own trap. Like stay away from mine. Like I do not, I am like so passionate about it because I similarly ate very plant-based, very plant-based paleo for so long. And I literally had like a seven month pregnant bloated belly. Um, even being like fit and lean, like, like I looked pregnant and I blame those damn salads. Dang it. I'm thinking of doing a fruit and bone broth fast reset. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mentioned that in the Facebook group of Fully Nourished because I wanted you guys to kind of be aware of it. I don't put it as a part of the Fully Nourished curriculum because a lot of people are too weak to handle it. They start to get shaky, dizzy, feel that those imbalanced blood sugar symptoms. So it's kind of one of those things where you feel it out, you feel if your body can handle it, you make sure you're consuming enough juice and bone broth to keep your blood sugar stable and kind of just listen to your body and eat if you need to. What is a good source of fiber? I heard you say some vegetables are thyroid suppressive, but usually that is my main source of fiber. Um, 
who said you need a ton of fiber? That's a question. Um, I usually just do like uh, a raw carrot salad once or twice a day or a raw carrot once or twice a day. Lots of roots and fruits. So root vegetables, squashes, lots of fruits. Um, and that would be my main sources of fiber. They're a lot gentler and they really help with digestion. They get things moving. But again, like if you, if you like a little bit of vegetable fiber, that's fine. Just cook them really, really well and see if that helps. But if your body's, if they're passing right through you, your body's not the, your body's rejecting them pretty much and the bacteria in your gut are not able to break them down. What probiotics do you recommend? Um, I don't recommend taking probiotics all the time, but if you like to take a probiotic, I really like mega spore biotic or just thrive probiotic. Thank you for everything, Jessica. You always help so many people, including myself. I appreciate it. I love, I just love chatting health with you guys because I know you guys are passionate. You're trying to heal your bodies and I have so much information that I've been exposed to for years. Like I just want to like give it to you so that you can um, start to take some steps to get your health back. Um, hi there. I have melasma and want to support my liver with desiccated liver supplement, but they are high in copper and copper is known to aggravate melasma. Do you think it's probably okay anyway? Also was wondering about which antiandrogen should be good take when coming off the pill. Thanks for everything. Um, so when you have melasma, if you've been on the pill, that's probably the driver of melasma. Keep in mind, estrogen drives melasma. The reason why people say copper aggravates a melasma is because copper makes estrogen binded to the tissues. However, desiccated liver is not just copper, it also has zinc, it also has iron, it also has plenty of B vitamins, and the healthy liver of a healthy animal is gonna help your liver become more healthy. So I always say that liver is one of the most powerful foods. Um, but I would say the melasma is probably being driven by high estrogen levels and polyunsaturated fats. And, um, Keep in mind that once polyunsaturated fats interact with the sun, they oxidize, right? And what we're seeing is oxidation and something called lipofuscin. And lipofuscin uh, has to do with heavy metals and polyunsaturated fats. So um, I wouldn't worry about anti-androgens. I would just worry about getting the liver to detoxify, supporting your nutrition, and then if you need to add in anti-androgens, that's fine, but I really don't stress about anti-androgens, especially like the people that promote saw palmetto. Oh my gosh, don't ever take saw palmetto, you guys. Um, it is so dangerous. Um, you don't want to block DHT um, that way. Like there are other ways to get DHT lower and don't, don't block DHT. The body's driving DHT up for a reason. And when we try to block things like that, it does not end well for us. So, you know, making sure your zinc levels are good, that kind of thing. Keep in mind, birth control is high in copper, so it can deplete zinc and complete, it can deplete things like vitamin C and vitamin E and B vitamins. So I'd focus more on those things rather than focusing on like, oh gosh, I got to detox my liver or I got to like lower my androgens. No, you got to support your body so that it rebalances as quickly as possible. I don't know how I'm going to word this, but what should a woman's health be like when wanting to get pregnant? I feel it my body to reproduce it's intense but i absolutely won't do it until i'm healthy in a loving partnership and this is something we want just don't want to mess up myself or my baby because of a feeling yeah well you're probably starting to see like your hormones balance you're trying to see your vitality and your fertility come back a lot of women when they gain a little weight you know that 10 to 20 pounds they are balancing their hormones they're balancing their blood sugar they're super nourished like that is the natural feeling of feeling nice and fertile and juicy so um i i think it's kind of one of those things where if you feel ready and you're like damn, let's do this. Um, just kind of get your basics done. Like if you suspect, I, I remember you're coming off of an SSRI, so probably not the greatest time like at this moment, but maybe like a month from now, check your hormones. I usually recommend a pre-fertility check of a full thyroid panel um, and your progesterone levels, obviously, and then estrogen uh, as well, because high estrogen levels is very stressful to the child. Um, and it has been implicated in things like autism. So we wanna make sure that all of our hormones are good. And then if we're nourishing our body, hey, bring it on. So I think it's really just a personal decision. And if you feel ready, um, you feel ready, but also you know, be reasonable about it, logical about it. I got an organic acid test done and it showed that I have terrible detoxification. I also have bad MTHFR mutation. I'm just wondering if there's any correlation. Yeah, of course. If you have a bad MTHFR mutation, you'll have terrible detoxification, um, but that can be helped with, uh, you know, taking MTHFR cofactors, um, like methylated B vitamins, those types of things. But a lot of times people see their MTHFR gene mutation become more expressed when their body is under a lot of stress. 
So I always like to look at the oats in comparison with hormones, thyroid, gut, everything. Uh, do you recommend taking magnesium supplements every day? Um, I recommend doing something with magnesium. If you have low magnesium, then yes. If not, kind of just a couple times a week is fine. I like to do transdermal as well, so magnesium oil at night. Taking magnesium oil at night, like putting it on your skin, ensures that you're getting some type of exposure, and then you'll um, continue to, uh, when you add in a supplement, you'll add a little bit more. I know some of this is normal because he's only got about three teeth, but my baby's stool has chunks of his food in it. Is there any way to help babies better digest food? Um, I would kind of move their hips around, uh, put them in kind of a squat position. I like to give them like a gentle massage, um, maybe like some di some baby safe digestion. Um, I'm wondering if like you eating digestive enzymes will help, but uh, he might be eating things that are not working for them. Him, if he's if you see food in his stool, then probably not working for him. Okay, Instagram's cutting me off right now. It's been an hour, so I'm gonna end this so I can save it. But if I didn't get to your question, I'm gonna go live for another 30 minutes so you can ask it again. So I'll see you in a second.